Hello, hello. We're slowly starting. Awesome. Really, really nice that so many people came tonight. I'm, I'm very uh, happy that this community is growing and uh, you, you make it here for the paper discussion group, uh, which happens every first Wednesday of the month here at the AI campus. And um, yeah, I would uh, like to explain a little, little bit what I uh, experienced uh, a few weeks ago at CDPR in Vancouver. And um, normally I would now introduce the speaker, but uh, I'm the speaker this time. So I'll just uh, briefly summarize my background. So uh, I studied engineering science uh, for my bachelor's in at TU Munich, and then went on to study robotics and machine learning also at TU Munich and uh, then started as a machine learning researcher at uh, Mirandix Momentum uh, about one and a half years ago. And um, yeah, so uh, actually Max, uh, who is sitting here, is one of our co-authors of a workshop paper uh, that we have uh, submitted and um, presented at CVPR this year. Uh, so this was uh, one of the reasons why I traveled there. And um, yeah, I'd just like to share some, some insights. Uh, I will... Uh, structure this talk in uh, three segments. So first of all, I'll highlight some uh, general impressions that I got at CVPR. Uh, then I'll uh, go over nine papers. Uh, so quite a lot to go through, but uh, I won't go into deep detail, of course. It's rather uh, just to give you like a high level overview of uh, what I found interesting. And uh, then at the end, I will uh, end with some uh, food for thought which uh, will hopefully uh, also inspire you a little bit. Uh, which um, So this food for thought is mainly uh, some insights that I gained from uh, the keynote talks, which were a little bit longer and inspirational uh, talks, essentially. Um, yeah. Yeah, so normally um, you can ask questions during uh, the talk, but uh, I think this time I would prefer the questions at the end, uh, just because we have a lot of material to go through this time. Um, and um, also, uh, I would like to include questions from the chat. And I just can't do two things at once. So I'm monitoring the chat and giving the talk. So uh, I just uh, want to focus on the presentation first and then uh, do the questions after. And of course, as always, there's a bit of time for, for mingling at the end and, and connecting. Uh, and one thing uh, to say uh, beforehand, uh, I'm a bit jet lagged because I uh, came uh, home yesterday only. So uh, it's still like in the morning now for me, nine in the morning. Um, so bear with me if I... Uh, screw up any uh, formulations or uh, if I um, miss what I'm trying to say. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, start with the CVPR impressions. Uh, if you don't know where Vancouver is, it's on the southwest side of Canada um, and uh, up here in the top left. And uh, it's really like a beautiful town. Uh, you can see the city center is uh, located and surrounded by the sea and you have the mountains in the back and this is really the first time I experienced this that you could look out the window and you would have like sea in front of you mountains and snow on top of the mountains people like uh, potentially skiing in the winter so uh, it's a really beautiful city surrounded by uh, beautiful nature and the conference happened here at the Vancouver Convention Center in the north of the city center uh, and the convention center was uh, directly uh, at the at the seaside uh, here in this left uh, older building uh, were the keynote talks in the east uh, building there was the expositions where the companies had uh, stands and would present themselves and there were also the poster sessions that uh, happened in this uh, right uh, more modern building um just to share some more photos of CVPR, uh, this uh, left image shows like this uh, huge modern uh, building, which was very beautiful, I think. Uh, and they also had great uh, breakfast there. Uh, and I would just like to share this one uh, video of uh, where I had uh, breakfast and you could see like the water airplanes uh, coming in and uh, landing and starting uh, while you're having breakfast uh, and having coffee. That was pretty, pretty amazing. And yeah, huge shout out to the organizers of the conference, of course, for that. And um, yeah, just to uh, share some, some numbers and uh, insights onto uh, CVPR. So uh, there were 9,000 submitted papers uh, and only 2,500 that got accepted. So the uh, acceptance rate was approximately 25%. Um, and there were around 7,000 people that joined in person. 
uh, which is a lot, like it was a huge amount of people really. Um, uh, of those, uh, 3,000 joined virtually, so it was a hybrid format this time. And uh, just to compare that with the numbers from 2019, uh, there were 9,000 people uh, back in uh, Long Beach uh, in uh, California. So actually we're not really back at the 2019 uh, numbers yet uh, due to COVID uh, mainly. Um, and another thing that was quite interesting to me is that uh, the number of companies uh, presenting at CVPR has also decreased. Uh, so uh, this year it was 116, um, but uh, yeah, in 2019 it was 181. And also the exposition area has halved. Uh, so I guess also the economic uh, downturn is hitting uh, research by now. And uh, you can uh, see a bit of decrease in the participating companies here. Cool. Uh, now to the more exciting part, maybe, uh, to the papers that I'm uh, going to present. Um, first of all, some disclaimers, of course, this is not my work. I just want to share some aha moments that I had and uh, yeah, hopefully inspire you to read those papers if you're uh, interested. And I just want to summarize the, the key message and uh, please do dive deeper and, and read the paper for yourself. Um, so the first paper I want to cover is FlexiVit, uh, one model for all patch sizes. And this was uh, presented by Google. And for that, I will need to uh, briefly summarize what vision transformers are. I guess most people here have uh, heard it. Um, however, it's important to uh, summarize this key aspect of patching again. Uh, so uh, as a vision, in a vision transformer, you have uh, an image that you want to process and uh, you cut that up into um, square patches, and uh, these uh, patches would then be linearly uh, embedded uh, before you before you input it into the transformer, uh, and you add a positional embedding and uh, feed, that, feed that through your transformer encoder. Um, there's one very key problem in doing that. Uh, you need to select the size of these patches that you want to um, Chop, it, chop the image up to. Uh, usually the size is uh, 16 or 32 or eight or 14. Uh, so there exists a number of different, um, yeah, <clears throat> common sizes that uh, people might wanna use. Uh, but this is a problem because um, you need to train a new vision transformer model for all of those patch sizes. And in the original uh, vision transformer paper, uh, here you would uh, typically see a table here uh, with uh, all of the different model configurations and different patch sizes. And um, generally, uh, a smaller patch size um, will most probably also give you higher performance, but it will also lead to increased compute because then uh, the number of tokens will be larger. And we know that the uh, complexity of transformers scales quadratically with the number of input tokens. So, so that, that'll be a problem. Um, the key idea of FlexiVit is now uh, to uh, have basically a memory bank of uh, patch embedding weights here. And um, then depending on your use case, you can just uh, um, create a larger or smaller uh, patch embedding weight, uh, patch embedding weights uh, from that via bilinear interpolation. And uh, then, uh, yeah, uh, patch your image, feed it through the uh, vision transformer as usual, uh, and then obtain your uh, performance. Um, and uh, the algorithm here is really simple. So uh, you uh, just have uh, an additional step in here before you, or after you sample the batch from your uh, data set, uh, where you randomly sample a, a patch size, uh, eight, 10, up to 40 or 48, and then you feed your uh, model uh, with that pot patch size, and um, yeah, it works uh, really, really well. And that's, uh, I think, a super cool result here on the next slide. Um, uh, if we look at that graph here on the left, uh, you see the uh, patch size on the x-axis and the inter image net uh, performance on the y-axis. And um, we see you can more or less choose whatever patch size you want uh, in this vision transformer. Um, and we also see that this trend holds that the smaller the patch size, the larger your performance gets. However, now if you compare it to uh, the vision transformer uh, B, which has been trained on uh, the uh, patch size of 16, and of course it only performs well on that pet very patch size, um, but not on other patch sizes you try to uh, generalize to. Um, so, 
yeah, I think that was a pretty cool cool result. Uh, also, of course, here on the right, you see um, the inference speed that uh, varies uh, with the different uh, patch sizes you um, that you uh, use. So if you use um, smaller patch sizes, you will have a um, increased compute and therefore a lower inference speed. And the very nice and neat thing about this is that uh, if you're, let's say, on a mobile application and uh, let's say your mo mobile phone uh, has many other things going on in the background and has less uh, compute available, uh, then you can just like scale up the patch size and then still run the same model, uh, but uh, just saving some, some, com some compute there. Um, I will every now and then have a drink of water. <laughs> Cheers. Also, if you're wondering what this thing on the top here is, it's basically a progress by uh, where we're at at the moment. So uh, this is the second paper now, which uh, Max, Johannes, and I uh, wrote. And uh, it's about uncovering the inner workings of Stego for safe, unsupervised semantic segmentation. So Stego um, is a really, really cool model that came out uh, last year at ICLR. Um, the Stego architecture and training strategy uh, really addresses one core problem, uh, which is that uh, we know that labeled training data is very scarce. scarce. Uh, however, unlabeled data is uh, very abundant. Um, and we've seen that uh, in the recent years, these self-supervised learning methods have uh, demonstrated a very cool progress on uh, unlabeled data sets. And uh, Stego now comes in uh, leveraging some of that progress uh, to do unsupervised semantic segmentation. In the bottom, you can see what the task entails. So you have an image and you want to uh, assign each pixel um, a class, uh, which is semantic segmentation. But in this case, since it's unsupervised, you just want to assign it a cluster. Um, and then later, as an optional step, maybe assign uh, that cluster a, a particular label that is human interpretable. And uh, we identified some. Uh, some missing benchmarks in the Stego uh, paper and uh, some yeah, more theoretical or also experimental uh, analysis of the approach. And that's why we've uh, written this uh, paper, which I presented in the workshop uh, for safe AI in all domains. So this is the only workshop paper. The, all, all the other papers were uh, full papers. Um, right, so just uh, one note about how Stego works. So uh, Stego uh, basically is uh, relying again on the vision transformer architecture. It's based on the pre-trained Dino vision transformer, uh, patches up the image, embeds the to tokens, uh, feeds it through the uh, transformer backbone. And uh, then you will have to upsample those, uh, um, yeah, those features uh, again to match the input resolution. And then you get like a, a pixel-wise uh, feature map essentially. And now Stego comes in here with these uh, violet parts and adds uh, a segmentation head, which uh, transforms uh, this uh, feature um, that represents one pixel into a lower dimensional uh, space. And uh, this segmentation head is a very simple, uh, simple module, just uh, I think two, two MLP layers, and uh, is trained uh, with a contrastive loss. And then um, Stego uh, identifies clusters in this uh, projected space with k-means. And uh, this is the cluster probe step here uh, at the very end. Um, and uh, just uh, for their um, analysis, they also um, do a supervised linear probe um, using the labels just to evaluate how, how high the uh, feature quality is of the segmentation head. And, um, yeah, I think I forgot nothing. So uh, let's dive into what uh, our paper was. Uh, so f our first study uh, was essentially a reproducibility study on uh, the Coco Stuff data set and also two other data sets that were originally reported in the uh, paper. And uh, we found, um, first of all, these results in the original paper. So in the blue color, you see the unsupervised uh, performance uh, and in red, the uh, supervised performance and uh, of course the supervised performance is a little bit better than the unsupervised uh, but it's still stunning to see that Stego does uh, manage to have an unsupervised performance on Coco stuff of around uh, 30 um, 
MIOU percent, uh, which is uh, missing here. <laughs> I see the, the uh, anyway. Um, so the second thing we see here is that the dyno performance is is, is much lower than uh, Stego. So um, we first uh, analyzed these results and were able to reproduce uh, Stego uh, with the pre-trained models that they provided. However, the dyno results, uh, so just training this cluster probe and linear probe um, without the segmentation head, actually yielded much higher um, results, much better results than were suggested in the paper. So that really motivated us to understand why. And um, yeah, it intrigued us a little bit. And uh, so we, we decided to do this uh, follow-up study with the main question of understanding uh, why does Stego uh, perform better than Dino uh, in this unsupervised case. And so we identified two main working mechanisms. Um, so first of all, we looked at the supervised linear probe performance across various embedding dimensions. So on the x-axis, you see here the projection dimension of the segmentation head that Stego adds. And um, basically, just looking at this orange curve here, uh, you can see that uh, Stego manages uh, to uh, compress this uh, representation space of Dino very well, um, and uh, you can reduce the dimensionality of uh, about uh, 10 times. So we have here 768 and re reduces to about 48 without uh, a big loss in performance. Uh, so we do argue that Stego is the dimensionality reduction technique. And um, the thing is that uh, it is uh, well known that uh, k-means uh, converges better in these fewer dimensions. Uh, so we hypothesize that this um, fact that Stego uh, is a dimensionality reduction technique also uh, impacts the unsupervised clustering performance uh, positively. And the second key working mechanism that we identified uh, is how we sort of uh, yeah, approach through the second graph where we plotted the uh, unsupervised cluster performance. Um, and here we see also again at this unreduced uh, dimension. So uh, we hypothesize that um, th this projection that the segmentation head learns is indeed uh, helpful for the k-means clustering algorithm. So probably the, the, the clusters that came come out are a little bit more distinct, possibly more spherical and uh, yeah, uh, just better to work with for the k-means uh, algorithm. And there are some other uh, interesting insights in the paper, and I hope uh, you, you, you'll you read it uh, if you're interested. And if you want to use uh, Stego, then just uh, drop me a line, and uh, I will happily uh, answer any questions. Um, the third paper that I want to uh, go over is uh, called Clippo. Image and image understanding from pixels, uh, also by uh, Google Research. And for that, I first need to introduce CLIP. Uh, so CLIP is a model uh, by OpenAI presented in 2021. Uh, and the idea was that you take a data set that is uh, labeled um, with image and then um, like a subcaption of that image that explains what's going on in the image. In this case, you have um, well, an image of a dog or a puppy. And then on the right, uh, you have the corresponding text, uh, which says uh, a birthday pug wearing a party hat. And um, now the main idea of CLIP is that uh, you have two neural networks. You have a vision transformer and a text transformer. And you feed these individual modalities uh, to those two transformers and uh, want uh, essentially if those... Um, if, this, if these two um, pieces of information, the photo and the text, make up a pair, that those uh, embeddings uh, of, of, of the pieces of information, uh, that they lie close together in space. Um, so this is the, the contrastive loss, essentially, that they presented. And if you randomly sample um, this pair, uh, then you want um, um, the embeddings to lie far from each other in the embedding space. And Flippo now does the following. So uh, instead of having two transformers, the vision transformer and the text transformer, they say, well, let's just use the vision transformer and uh, take the text and um, to put it in uh, like a Unicode uh, 
representation and or, uh, and, and and just make um, a photo out of the text uh, or an image out of the text. So here you have a birthday party wearing a P already hat. And uh, you, if you just feed that into the vision transformer, uh, they ask uh, how far can we get? Um, and it might seem like a little strange, but I think it's uh, a super interesting idea because um, if you're going with the left approach, you need to, for every, every modality, you need to individually um, um, yeah, uh, generate an architecture uh, for which modality you want to process. And in this NLP context, uh, you have always things that are a bit difficult to deal with, for example, tokenization and a limited size of vocabulary, uh, which will just uh, not be a problem if you uh, abstract that away and throw it all in a vision transformer. So let's see uh, what they get. So the results are, are pretty cool. So uh, apparently the Clipboard performance approaches BERT uh, on the glue benchmark. Uh, the glue benchmark is, is yeah, one of the most uh, relevant benchmarks in NLP uh, containing a stack of, of different tasks. And um, also CLIP approximately performs as well as, uh, CLIPO performs approximately as well as CLIP, uh, just uh, a little bit worse. Uh, however, um, you only have half the number of parameters, which is, Kind of neat. Um, and also they show some generalization uh, to some tasks that the models uh, were not trained to do. Um, so here they um, do some analysis on a VQA data set um, where they just um, append the text uh, as an image on top of the actual image. Uh, what is the dog doing? And then from that uh, representation uh, train a classifier head um, and the model does, does really well on that. I don't have the numbers, but uh, you can check it out in their paper. I look like I'm drinking beer, but it's uh, alcohol free, so <laughs> keeping me on track. And um, there were two really interesting uh, facets of this paper uh, analysis that they did that uh, I just haven't heard of before, so I wanted to share it here. Uh, this first concept uh, called modality gap. I was first uh, presented at NURBS 2022. You see the uh, caption in the, or the, the citation in the top right. And essentially, um, this paper identified that uh, if you map, let's say, um, an image of the dog and the corresponding text uh, of this dog image uh, with clip, uh, then you will always somehow get a fixed offset uh, at these pairs. And so you see um, the blue represent one modality. I think it was uh, images and the orange uh, represent text. Uh, and you somehow always get this weird fixed offset, uh, which uh, is, of course, a bit harmful to this um, model because uh, it will make uh, tasks like um, yeah, K and N classification or image retrieval also much harder. So ideally you want really the image of the dog and the caption of the image of the dog to end up in the same exact space. Um, and Clippo also has this modality gap. Uh, so they showed that here in the middle. Um, however, if you pre-train Clippo with text only, uh, you can reduce that dimensionality, uh, modality gap. So here you see on the right, uh, just throw in two pairs of texts and uh, see whether this text uh, comes from the same um, uh, book or so, uh, from the same uh, abstract or so, uh, then um, yeah, you, you, you get a improved uh, modality gap. However, this modality gap measure they're using here is a little bit, uh, yeah, um, not capturing the, the, the whole problem yet because uh, um, they're only computing the, the distance between the points, however, not the um, rotation. So um, you could still essentially um, rotate this orange uh, cloud uh, on top of the blue one in this very right image and then uh, get the same modality gap out, which is, of course, a problem of the measure. Uh, but uh, yeah. This thing aside, I um, thought it was a pretty interesting facet of that uh, paper. And the second interesting facet was uh, typographic attacks, uh, which I wasn't aware of either. So these uh, clip style models that have been pre-trained with uh, vision and text, they are prone uh, to typographic attacks. So if you have an apple 
and train a classifier on the flip uh, embedding, then, uh, well, you get a pretty high accuracy uh, or prediction score on, on this Apple uh, Granny Smith. Uh, however, if you um, write a sticker on it with iPod, you get a very high uh, accuracy uh, that the model uh, yeah, classifies it as iPod. Uh, um, very high. Um, yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, this also holds true for, for other um, the, um, texts written on the image, and I find that pretty pretty intriguing. And uh, this Clippo uh, result says that um, all models are largely able to ignore the typographic attack, and the Clippo models are on par with or better than the counterparts relying on a tokenizer. So somehow uh, Clippo deals uh, with this problem a little bit better than uh, Clip, uh, or at least not worse. You would usually expect that if you uh, input uh, text into this vision transformer, it might be prone to making mistakes when it sees the wrong text, uh, but apparently uh, that's not the case. Open scene, uh, 3D scene understanding with open vocabularies. So um, just to give you a little bit of background again, um, traditional 3D semantic segmentation usually works uh, in the following. So you have an 3D geometry or let's just say an image uh, for now. Um, and then you have a supervised learning algorithm that uh, maps this image or precisely every pixel of the image to a target class. And um, the problem with the supervised learning in this case is that uh, you will have a fixed set of target classes. So in this case, uh, I don't know, 20 target classes that all correspond to some things in the kitchen. And um, that's a little bit limiting uh, if you were trying to detect uh, objects uh, that are not in this um, set of target classes, uh, then you will have a problem. And um, in comes uh, open vocabulary segmentation. So um, this is a general trend that I've been observing a lot. So people are uh, really uh, hyped about these open vocabulary uh, models where you don't uh, have to have a um, where you're basically not basing off of supervised uh, learning uh, data sets anymore, uh, but rather use uh, models like uh, CLIP to, to bootstrap um, uh, open vocabulary uh, semantic segmentation. And uh, so the, the rough idea of this paper is basically um, you uh, get the CLIP text features uh, that also correspond nicely uh, with the image. Um, and now you need to uh, map your uh, clip um, image features um, onto uh, this 3D um, geometry somehow. I don't really know uh, how they do it, but uh, you can read that up in the paper. So you just get a 3D representation of uh, this image. And therefore, you also get the, the text embeddings at this exact location um, or uh, yeah, a text representation of, of that. Um, of that position in space for, for this 3D scene. And uh, now the cool thing is you can reason about the properties of this uh, 3D scene uh, only by using the cosine similarity metric. And uh, I really want to show you this demo, which I think is very cool. Um, they have this 3D um, scene um, where you can type a text query up uh, in, the, in the top left and then um, basically, would encode that with the uh, clip text encoder, compare it uh, to all of the um, uh, yeah, voxel um, uh, text embeddings uh, in, the, uh, in the scene, and then uh, compute the cosine similarity. And you see, like uh, all of the objects that relate to the um, to the word um, light up in, in yellow. And uh, that also works for very, very small objects. So here they're typing in Snoopy, which would probably not have ever been in the training data set of a supervised learning model. And now the cool thing is you can also type in affordances. So which ob objects can I sit on? And now uh, the, 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 the to uh, toilet seat just uh, lit, lit up and you can see they type in glass and all the uh, cabinets and windows light up and you can also enter. <laughs> Fragile, and it will highlight all the vases and uh, uh, things that could easily break uh, in this scene. And I just found this demo particularly uh, very, very neat. And um, 
and that's why I wanted to to show you that. And uh, for the details, please please go to the paper. Yeah, it can also identify a Christmas decoration uh, if you type in festive. <laughs> Cool. Um, so we're almost uh, halfway through uh, this next uh, paper. Uh, it's just a one slide summary of visual programming, compositional visual reasoning without training. Oh, and this was an award candidate as well. Um, and the basic idea of this VisProg paper is that they present a paper, uh, a framework uh, that builds computer vision pipelines from natural language. So given this image, um, you can describe some task. For example, replace the ground with white snow and the bear with a white polar bear. And now in, in real life, the uh, ML engineer or computer vision engineer has to well look up what are the state of the art segmentation models, um, what are the state of the art in painting methods, et cetera, et cetera, um, and then construct this long computer vision pipeline. Um, and this paper now um, says, well, okay, we can abstract all that away and um, just imp implement like a high level uh, library where you can call like segmentation models and painting models and also other libraries like OpenCV and PIL to do basic image manipulation. And we just uh, tell GPT-3 uh, through in-context learning how to use that library for a particular task. And that really, really works well and uh, gets you a CVPR highlight. <laughs> so uh, they did a really, really great job at um, presenting that paper. Also, I mean, the code base really looks nice. Uh, so you should check it out if you, if you want to use something like that. And um, in this image here, you see that it's uh, or like the qualitative uh, way of how it works. So you have an image, uh, you call a sec to segment the different objects, uh, you can get all that out. Now you select one of those um, uh, objects or segments of the image uh, through a vision transformer or clip in this case again, um, uh, and this, this text uh, that you're looking for. Uh, and then you have an in-painting model which runs stable diffusion under the hood. And, and now you get the bear with the snow and the ground um, and you do the same thing for the polar bear. And um, found that a pretty cool uh, framework overall. <laughs> okay, um, the next paper I'd like to talk about is hands-off uh, labeled data set generation with no additional human annotations uh, by Georgia Tech, Amazon, and TRI. And the key idea is that you basically have a few labeled images, approximately 50 uh, images, um, that you have the segmentation masks of, and you have a generative model uh, with which you can just produce new images of that uh, domain. And with these two things, you can somehow create an infinite number of labels, images that you can then later train your supervised learning model on. Um, and the key idea is that um, this paper combines the areas of gun inversion with data set generation. And uh, let's run through the gun inversion 101 here. Um, basically, um, a gun uh, in the forward pass would take a, a, a would sample uh, this latent space and obtain um, this uh, vector Z, for example, and then generate a fake image um, of this person here. Um, however, now if you want to do like useful stuff with guns and, uh, for example, um, do image manipulation of uh, George W. Bush here, for example, um, you want to find out where this real person or real image lies in the gun embedding space or gun latent space. Um, and this then allows you, once you have that, you can like shift around that point in the uh, latent space and then, um, well, see how your image is altered and you might figure out like which uh, dimensions are the dimensions that correspond to age and uh, then you can do uh, image manipulation that way. 
And uh, gun inversion usually just works uh, in the autoencoder fashion. So uh, you have here on the right in figure two, you have uh, G, which is the pre-trained gun uh, generator. Uh, and you just uh, stick an encoder uh, in, in the front. Uh, and now you have a set of unlabeled images uh, that you run through that pipeline. And uh, you basically uh, want to, while keeping this uh, gun generator fixed, uh, you want to minimize uh, photometric uh, reconstruction loss, for example. And uh, thereby, uh, you learn the inverse of, of that gun. So now, uh, how can we use this gun inversion for dataset generation? Uh, so the authors here uh, present basically a two-step pipeline. Uh, first of all, um, you train uh, this violet label generator, um, and that works in the following way. So you have a a uh, few um, of those images that come from your label data set, approximately 50 images. You invert those through a gun. Then you have these latent vectors. Uh, you uh, feed them forward through the gun generator um, and uh, obtain some uh, re uh, intermediate representations uh, from the gun uh, and form this hypercolumn representation. So um, in this case, they're using style gun two and they well, just extract uh, some of the intermediate results from the layers and then uh, upsample that such that you get a, a pixel-wise um, feature map again. And with this, uh, from this pixel-wise feature map, you will now train an MLP, which is this label generator. It needs very few um, yeah, training data to, to train. Uh, and this label generator will then output uh, a segmentation mask um, and you can train that through uh, cross entropy or some other supervised loss that you that you fancy. And uh, now you have these two parts. Uh, you have a pre-trained gun, which you already had before, but now you also have a label generator. And uh, now you can sample from this latent. Um, and simply by constru constructing that hypercolumn representation again, you can um, yeah generate. Uh, infinitely many labels uh, for these uh, images. And I think that's that's a super neat um, neat application. I think if you're in a domain like this, you probably see in these data sets, uh, they are, uh, yeah, um, they come with a couple of uh, pre-trained, uh, pre-labeled classes. However, if you want to have like a class for like the left eyebrow and the right eyebrow and uh, the teeth and the upper lip, lip and the, uh, lower lip etc and be like very detailed um, you can just generate your uh, training data here on the fly um, of course the big 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 caveat is that you need a pre-trained gun on this uh, data domain uh, but yeah um, i would be excited to to find out whether this works also with other generative models and here are some yeah results on other data sets uh, they show this uh, for the car parts data set and uh, most impressively for the cityscapes data set. So here they just generate some more scenes uh, and the according uh, labels uh, to that, and also uh, depth maps, in fact. And uh, why is this paper so relevant? Um, they also highlight this in the paper. Um, of course, in machine learning, we often have this um, problem of uh, like uh, long tailed data distributions. So you would have. Um, uh, very many uh, images that show one class, however, then few images that show another class. Uh, for example, you might, might have uh, very few images of people wearing glasses in your data set, however, then uh, super many uh, images of people not wearing glasses. And uh, if you're trying to train a supervised learning algorithm, of course, this class imbalance is a, is a problem. So um, this method now, uh, allows you to generate um, more um, training data in these uh, yeah, low frequency regimes. And I think that's a really, really cool um, idea here. And uh, here they show basically that uh, if you, like the more images of uh, people with glasses you uh, integrate into the training data set that you um, train on, then uh, the uh, uncertainty of your uh, trained classifier will, will go down.
Ooh, um, image bind, one embedding space to bind them all. Also a CVPR highlight uh, by Meta AI. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about Clip today, uh, which takes in uh, images and text. Uh, image bind kind of uh, extends this idea to even more modalities. Um, in particular, they, they, they use images, videos, text, audio, depth, thermal, and IMU data. And um, the goal here is really multimodal representation learning beyond text and image. And um, if you would want to um, extend the clip idea further to more modalities, um, like these, uh, these ones that I've mentioned, um, it would require a labeled data set that uh, has a pair for all of these, uh, or has one image that has also a video corresponding to it, also a text, also audio, also depth, also thermal, and IMU. And if you like getting that label data set is really, really hard. And yeah, combining, uh, yeah, it's just, um, it just doesn't exist as data set. Um, however, there are many data sets that um, all have the, that have images and one of those modalities. Uh, so for example, you would have a data set that has an image and a text description of that image. You would have a data set that has an image or potentially a video and the audio stream of that. And uh, you would have a data set that has a, an image and then a thermal camera image of that. So you see that image is sort of the binding factor of, across all these uh, data sets. And um, they basically then extend this uh, contrastive learning uh, framework to all of those, um, to all of those uh, data sets. And uh, then obtain really, really cool uh, emergent properties that I wanted to show you. Um, so first of all, um, you have cross-modal retrieval. So uh, you could, for example, um, input uh, into this uh, text transformer, um, a train pulls into a busy station, and then you could uh, obtain like the closest uh, audio sample that would match that text. Or you could uh, co collect uh, the depth map that, be that best matches this uh, text sample, and then you would obtain um, an image like, like that. And um, there are also these analysis regarding embedding space arithmetic. So maybe you, back from the NLP days, maybe you uh, remember um, these uh, examples where you have like man plus royal equals king, and then what is uh, woman plus royal? You could uh, simply compute that through the embedding space. And now that idea also works neatly here in the embedding space of the um, image bind transformers. Um, you can have an um, image which shows this bird, and then you add. Uh, an audio of a motor, and then the closest, um, and then if you search the closest, uh, um, if you search the closest uh, data point in, in the image space again, uh, then you will retrieve this image of a motorcyclist uh, with some birds in it. So I think that's a pretty pretty cool result. And uh, what's also cool now is you can use pre-trained diffusion models. Um, that uh, are basing off of the clip uh, uh, te text uh, text feature space, um, and sim simply feed them with with audio because you've mapped the audio onto the the clip uh, text feature space. Uh, you can now just um, enter the penguin uh, sounds into Dali two in this case, and then generate um, the, a corresponding image uh, off of that. And that also works with uh, other models, uh, this idea. So uh, they showed here uh, DTIC, which is a pre-trained text-based detection module that also uses these clip uh, embeddings. And um, here they show uh, basically that this idea from the previous slide also uh, transfers to this uh, object detection task. So you would have an image and uh, feed uh, in uh, this uh, DTIC uh, model now um, the audio embedding of keyboard typing and clock alarm, and the DTEC uh, model could directly use this uh, embeddings and um, give you the correct uh, location of uh, these two items um, on the image. 
object detection with audio queries. I think that was a pretty, pretty cool thing. <laughs> okay, so we're almost at the end of the papers. I hope you're still with me. <laughs> uh, I, I still am. So um, this uh, eighth, eighth paper that I wanted to present is uh, Instruct Picks to Picks, um, Learning to Follow Image Editing Instructions uh, by Berkeley, also CVPR Highlight. And uh, yeah, I think for me, probably the, the most stunning uh, generative AI um, work at CVPR this year. Um, so <clears throat> we have generative models, right? You could um, say, hey, um, a dog sitting at the beach, and then a, a diffusion model would generate a, a dog sitting at the beach. However, uh, what if you wanted to modify um, an image that you already have? Um, so this is where instruct pix to pix comes in. Uh, you can feed it a image, um, a real image here, for example, of the Eiffel Tower, and say uh, add fireworks to the sky. Or another um, impressive example here of this oil painting, uh, make his jacket out of leather. And then uh, the model uh, would do the corresponding changes and leave the rest of the image more or less untouched. How does that work? So they have two key stages in their uh, pipeline. First of all, they're generating training data. And then in the second step, they're using that training data to feed a supervised learning model and also uh, supervised learning algorithm. First of all, um, you need these text edits uh, of like, um, what, what did we have here? Add fireworks to the sky. And uh, they use GPT-3 to, to bootstrap to these um, edit captions. So um, as an input, you would have a photograph of a girl riding a horse um, and uh, have some instruction, have her ride a dragon. And then um, what GPT should output is um, basically uh, a correlation or, or like it would take that input caption and just swap out in text uh, what uh, this instruction um, told you to do. So now, instead of a photograph of a girl riding a horse, now we have a photograph of a girl riding a dragon. OK, so now you have these pairs. Uh, with these pairs, uh, you can now feed a stable diffusion model um, and prompt to prompt, which is um, yeah an algorithm that, algorithm that makes sure that using two similar prompts, uh, you still get like a similar layout of the image. However, um, allow the diffusion model to um, yeah, change uh, the corresponding areas, some corresponding areas of the image such that it matches uh, this input uh, caption. And uh, then you get two images out, uh, one girl riding on a horse and one girl riding on a dragon. And uh, now you generate 450,000 of those. And then you can consequently do um, fine tuning of uh, another diffusion model that you now can also condition on an image. And uh, you can now like tell the edit that you want to do, turn her into a snake lady, and then uh, instruct pix to pix uh, will take care of the rest. And I think it's a pretty interesting pattern uh, to see these folks, uh, yeah, first uh, generating training data and often leveraging GPT-3 for that, for the text tasks and um, then fine-tuning a uh, model with the, the old approach that we know from supervised learning. Um, and yeah, here's some more qualitative results that I wanted to highlight. So this left image is the input, and uh, the edit instruction is add boats to the water. And it would also make the corresponding changes to the texture of the, um, of the uh, sea or the, of the lake. Um, because like if you have boats, you might also have wind, but I'm not sure if that's really true. So they're just highlighting that. But maybe the nicer example here is with the skyline. You can also see that the skyline is now pretty uh, neatly um, reflected in the in the sea or in the lake. Um, of course, this model also inherits uh, biases that are already present in the diffusion models, uh, and I think this is a pretty Striking example of it. Um, in the left, you have uh, an image of uh, a man and a woman, and you ask the model to turn them into flight attendants, and uh, then it turns it into two uh, 
persons that look more female, uh, and it also goes the other way, where if you want to make them look like doctors, uh, you get that bias into the other direction, where the man ma stays a man, but the woman is turned into a man. And yeah, I quite, I mean, of course, I, I don't like this example, but I think it's really important to have these uh, analysis also in computer vision papers. And I did see uh, some uh, papers also that, uh, that had an evaluation section on bias, and that's really, really uh, something that we should move towards, I think. If you will want to know more about these generative models, another cool uh, one to look up is Dream Booth, uh, where you could have um, many images of the same object. So here, uh, this dog, um, and then you could uh, yeah, generate the same dog in different scenarios, which uh, was pretty, pretty, pretty cool result as well. Okay, now on to my almost favorite paper, I think. Uh, it's called Integral Neural Networks, uh, also an award candidate uh, by Huawei. It's about pruning, and um, basically pruning is a process where you take a, a pre-trained neural network and you try to reduce its size somehow to make inference faster. And uh, yeah, possibly also to reduce uh, memory, uh, uh, memory usage. And uh, there are two ways to do uh, pruning usually. So you could um, identify the weights uh, that are not adding much contribution to the computation in your neural network, and then just zero those out and do weight pruning. Or you could uh, even identify all of the weights that lead up to a particular neuron, and then uh, prune all of those out, which would be called node pruning. And um, now, on to the idea of uh, integral neural networks. Um, in traditional neural networks, you have the discrete weight tensor. So at the end of the day, neural networks are matrix multiplications. And uh, these matrix multiplications use discrete values, uh, as you can see here. Um, however, the paper here presents to um, train using a smooth weight representation. Uh, and then later um, at um, inference time, or when you want to move the model into production, you just sample um, the smooth weight representation using a resolution that is arbitrary. So you could uh, have a very fine grained resolution or uh, a coarse grained resolution. And thereby you can basically determine how much of, uh, like how small you want your network to be. And um, yeah, just the, uh, See this again uh, in regular neural networks, you have a, a discrete uh, multidimensional tensors, whereas in integral neural networks, they are smooth. Uh, you can't use the discrete transformations of inputs anymore as uh, you do in regular uh, neural networks. Now you need to uh, actually integrate over the smooth function, uh, but um, this smooth function can be discretized uh, for inference. And um, normally what you do in regular neural networks after pruning is fine tune them again on the data set uh, because there is some loss in performance, of course, uh, but that's not uh, necessary in actual neural networks. Um, and of course, also you have a fixed model size after pruning in traditional neural networks, uh, whereas in integral neural networks, you can resize it on the fly. So again, if uh, your robot that explores the world has many other things going on on its processor or GPU, you can just use a smaller model um, version of the model uh, to save to save compute there. And the results are really stunning, I think. Uh, so in gray, you can see their results and uh, all of the other colors are um, yeah, baselines they compare to. And uh, pink is also uh, a variant of their paper. And if you look at uh, figure C here, for example, you can see um, you can compress a ResNet 18 up to 30% without losing almost anything uh, in ImageNet performance, uh, whereas all of the other um, techniques um, yeah, have a huge uh, drawbacks uh, the higher you uh, or the more you compress. Um, yeah, uh, what about pre-trained neural networks? Uh, can they somehow be still valuable to this approach? And uh, the authors say yes. They um, present a permutation algorithm um, that would permute uh, these discrete weights 
um, pre-trained neural networks into a shape uh, that is better approximate, approximate is that a word? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, using uh, smooth functions. And they simply do a smooth interpolation um, of this permuted discrete weights. And uh, that way you can still harness all of the pre trained networks that are out there, but uh, yeah, prune them in a very systematic uh, and I think, uh, yeah, beautiful way. Okay, dokie. So uh, we arrived at the last uh, part of this presentation, which is the food for thought. Uh, we made it through the papers and through the more technical stuff. So I just wanted to yeah highlight some um, things that inspired me uh, at the conference and take these last minutes for that. Um, there are three main takeaways or foods I have for you tonight. Uh, First is embodied foundation models, uh, robotics and computer vision, and AI and the hype. So first of all, uh, on foundation models as mo motion planners or foundation models computer vision. Uh, so, I mean, this term has been uh, going around in the last year or so, um, mainly describing multimodal models that are often transformer-based um, and show some sort of emergent properties that are useful to uh, downstream tasks and um, there's this one there are several examples that I want to show uh, that kind of inspired me uh, they used foundation models uh, the first one is in robotics and the second one on was driving um, in robotics you usually have uh, this very complex problem of motion planning so if you want your robot to fetch something from the drawer that must be um, turn into a very, very detailed plan of what needs to happen. So um, first of all, have a look around, scan the scene. Second step, uh, look where the kitchen is. Uh, third step, go to the uh, kitchen. Fourth step, uh, to repeat and look where the drawer is. And uh, then open the drawer and uh, check again what's in there. And blah, blah, blah. Um, so you see these motion plans can, can get very complex and now we see some trend uh, towards using uh, vision or generally foundation models uh, to, to execute this task. So we don't see any of the technicalities that go under the, uh, that happen under the hood. Uh, however, you can prompt this model using, uh, well, a text prompt, uh, fetch me the item from the drawer and then, um, the Palm E model, which is actually a joint work uh, by the TU Berlin and Google. And uh, they um, yeah, generate these high level motion plans using, using foundation models. And uh, then the lower level execution is done through traditional robot control. Uh, but yeah, I think it's still, I think it's still pretty, pretty impressive. And, uh, here at the end, the robot walks up to the human and uh, gives them the item. And uh, the second example I want to highlight is an autonomous driving. So um, this is uh, yeah, a result that I got from ChatGPT. Uh, if I drive and I see a yellow light or an orange light, what should I do? And then uh, ChatGPT gives me several ideas of what could that mean, like maybe that's a traffic signal, maybe it's flashing orange lights at inter intersection, and or yeah, it has... Uh, many of these uh, rules that we uh, know um, in, from driving or from experience are already somehow encoded in, in uh, GPT-like models. And um, there was a very inspiring talk by Alex Kendall, who uh, has co-founded uh, Wave. It's an autonomous driving startup uh, from the UK that are mainly using yeah, AI, of course, to uh, tackle the driving problem. And uh, they are working on basically an AI assistant uh, that uh, could tell you um, like what its decisions are currently um, doing. And uh, he also presented this slide, which is very nice. I think uh, you can also have a vision model that has these uh, uh, properties. So uh, you can ask the vision text model, should you start and proceed through the intersection? Why? And then the uh, model says, well, no, you should not proceed through the intersection at the traffic uh, since the traffic uh, light is red, and so on. So uh, I think that's that's pretty pretty cool. And uh, 
maybe once these uh, yeah, assistants uh, that communicate through us in language will uh, end up in autonomous cars and also make possibly autonomous driving more, more explainable and more accessible. Um, another thought uh, by Alex Kandel uh, was um, on world models. So uh, world models, uh, he calls a generative model that predicts uh, what happens next in a scene, uh, conditioned on an action. Um, so Wave collected this huge unlabeled data set um, where uh, it's not actually unlabeled, but you probably have the steering commands as well. Uh, however, you um, can now use that huge data set to, to train this world model. Um, and this is some output, visual output of this world model. This is purely simulated footage. So all of this is uh, not real. Uh, but um, what they found is that using this autoregressive um, vision model, produces very, very uh, yeah, semantically coherent uh, outputs. And uh, you can sort of steer through the, uh, navigate through the landscape, and then the model would on the fly generate uh, this uh, image or the next uh, image uh, in here. And uh, I think the results are pretty impressive, and it could potentially also lead towards lowering this sim to real gap uh, that we also often uh, experience. And uh, here, this uh, here's similar results uh, where they basically show well, what if I start from the same frame and then take take different actions? And you see here, um, the model has taken turn has taken a turn at an intersection, um, once to the left, once to the right, and once it uh, goes just straight. And in all different cases, it uh, generates uh, well meaningful content. And what he also said is that uh, autonomous driving might actually be the first example of where we see embodied AI, so um, a neural network with a body um, come into life uh, and not like robotics, uh, where we assume like household robotics should be such an easy task, but it's not. So it's, it might be autonomous driving where we see that first. Um, there was also pretty pretty much talk around uh, robotics, as you might have heard. I mean, I consider myself a robotics person, so maybe I also picked up more on that uh, and the other topics. But um, one very inspiring talk uh, by Jitendra Malik was um, that vision and the vision community now needs to go and help uh, the robotics community, and especially the manipulation community. And I think it was very yeah inspiring just as a high level thing to see uh, researchers of this uh, track record, uh, like sort of steering the community in, in ways. Uh, and uh, in this uh, particular example, it goes uh, towards manipulation, uh, which is a very uh, interesting and particularly hard problem. I'm not gonna uh, yeah, go into the details, but if you're interested in that, uh, just come and talk to me later. And uh, this last uh, keynote talk that I was very inspired by was by Rodney Brooks. Uh, he's a professor emeritus uh, from MIT. He uh, has, been, has headed the computer science, and computer science and AI lab, CSAIL, for a long time. And yeah, he just uh, I feel brought everyone a little bit, uh, like brought the hype about AI a little bit down again, which I found kind of refreshing. Um, and one uh, yeah, citation he gave uh, in that talk was uh, by Roy Amara. Um, we tend to overestimate the effect of the technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. So uh, one example that he's given in, for that uh, citation, I think is pretty cool. Um, so when computers first started to, to come around, Everyone was sort of fearing that uh, the jobs like librarians uh, will immediately uh, yeah, disappear into nothing and will be replaced by computers. But effectively, librarians kept on having their jobs and keep, kept on using computers as a tool to do their job for another 40 years or so. But then uh, with the advent of the internet and mobile devices, knowledge at your fingertips, uh, that's really the moment where uh, librarians got impacted a lot and uh, not, yeah, at the first minute computers were around. So 
he is making this argument that a large ecosystem is needed uh, for technologies uh, to have a real impact on, on all of us in society and not just, yeah, uh, one working idea like computers. And uh, yeah, just one kind of funny uh, result he, or one funny uh, anecdote he showed here, he uh, showed a paper from Ichikai in 1979 with the title, An Automobile with Artificial Intelligence. And uh, the first uh, sentence reads, uh, this paper describes an automobile with artificial intelligence, which consists of a road pattern recognition unit and a, and a problem solving unit. The vehicle is completely autonomous and can be driven without a human driver. Um, and then the last sentence is, uh, the vehicle was successfully driven under various environments at the speed with 30 kilometers per hour. And uh, he said, yeah, well, it uh, seems like autonomous driving is solved and should be out on the road pretty soon now. Um, but of course, uh, we all know that uh, autonomous driving is still not there. And um, yeah, uh, I mean, it's making huge progress, but uh, it's taking much longer to implement. And uh, if you see these headlines from um, yeah, 2017, NVIDIA to introduce level four enabling system by 2018, uh, BMW to launch autonomous INX in 2021, uh, and so on. So we've been uh, pretty horribly wrong at uh, predicting the future there, and uh, maybe not considering these, uh, yeah, long tail uh, uh, problems that we're that we're uh, running into to make uh, or trying to solve to make uh, an idea like autonomous driving really work for everyone and, and robustly. And uh, one very last thing I'm going to say, uh, yeah, uh, I think I'm often a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of AI research that's coming out every day. And of course, you see the great uh, yeah, research teams by, by Meta, Amazon, Google, et cetera, and like thinking, well, how can I compete with them? Or where's my place in this whole picture? And uh, he, like between the lines, he just said this one thing. Uh, don't be the best, be the only. And I thought that was a very uh, inspirational thing uh, because, yeah, it just uh, asks you or inspires you to just go a different way like uh, the masses are going and maybe, uh, yeah, just take take a different route and, and see what's coming out there and maybe you'll, you'll be uh, rewarded by that. And, uh, yeah, with that, I want to close and uh, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, now we would have some time for questions. So we usually do this um, like that. I give the microphone around. Uh, if, the, if there are any questions, are there questions? Yeah, there are also questions online. Uh, no, this is just uh, no taking. Uh, uh, bots. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for, for the very nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you can maybe comment on your view on the reproducibility of the results. So, I mean, especially with the big labs, um, and they often don't really publish everything. And so, so how... What do you expect? How reproducible is what you saw here? Um, yeah, I mean, I think one positive aspect to say is that uh, even the big uh, research labs uh, like Meta, they um, open source their code and they were also really open about uh, their work. Um, so just talking to them didn't feel like they want to hide any information from me as well. So it was just a very good technical discussion with them. So I um, think in terms of that, that's fine. Uh, I guess the other part that I would like to say is that we always have this problem of like real world data sets versus data sets that you use in academia or, or research. And uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, research only uh, has those data sets that are already out there and uh, I think it's, it's, it's a good uh, reason for them to use them. However, whether that model actually works in your use case uh, is a completely different story. So yeah, it's hard to give a generic answer to that, unfortunately. Uh, 
So I would uh, urge you to just try it out. And uh, for example, uh, the code uh, for all of these uh, papers that I presented uh, are out there. And uh, yeah, hope you explore. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again. Um, so, so many new impressions. What is it? What you want to try home next? Um, yeah. Good question. Um, so I'm uh, yeah particularly intrigued by uh, the these things that Jitendra Malik said that. Uh, Manipulation is so hard, um, and I wonder whether there's any progress that could be made towards like integrating um, other senses that robots have, uh, for example, tactile information. So you see uh, these models like ImageFind, they process a variety of different uh, senses. However, uh, a very key sense in the problem of manipulation is, is tactile, right? So uh, without knowing how it feels like, it might be very hard to solve the Rubik's Cube or something like that. And uh, I think, yeah, extending the idea of uh, multimodal towards uh, more senses that are relevant to robots uh, is, is a pretty interesting topic that, yeah, I might want to work on in the future. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask you because all the papers that you've presented here are coming from basically five, the best five companies and two universities. Um, what about Europe? Do we do see any prominent research or any company that you say like, okay, these guys, I don't know, maybe in France, in UK, in, I don't know, Switzerland, are making a bit here, or is it just these guys that we are all looking at? Uh, so these guys also have a lot of labs here in Europe, uh, which is cool, I think. So, for example, uh, the Meta team has a pretty big research lab in Paris, uh, where Dino V2, for example, was developed. And I'm not sure about Segment anything, but uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's one, one part of my answer. And then there are very strong universities. Uh, in, in Germany, so particularly a very strong presence of, of TU Munich, I saw ETH as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, also a refreshing amount of, of, of diverse uh, universities from all over the world. Uh, I, yeah, maybe it's also like my lens a little bit. I, I might feel a little bit more attracted towards uh, papers where there are like a bunch of people standing around. Like, discussing things and uh, I might want to jump in and, and join that discussion and uh, then it ends up, well, okay, there's a meta logo on the paper, uh, which uh, then maybe is my own bias. Um, but I did try to to include uh, some uh, other papers in, in, the, in the talk as well. And maybe if you want to uh, have an extended uh, recommendation list, uh, you can come up to me later and there, there may be a bit more uh, yeah, papers from uh, other other institutes. Thank you. Cool. I think there are no more further questions. Then uh, yes, thank you so much for coming. Um, and yeah, please stick around for a little while and uh, talk to each other and use the time to connect. And otherwise, I'll see you next time. And uh, have a great hope. And good night. <laughs>